What's up everyone? I'm Nick. This is Swiffle Thinking and we are pretty much done with this course. We only have three videos left and they're kind of just wrap up videos. And in this video, we're just going to quickly uh, touch on some optimizations that we can do to our current code. So the first thing we're going to do is update our code so that our app looks good on an iPad. Now there's not going to be much we have to do because we use Swift UI and we use adaptive formatting, so most of our screens are gonna look good on iPad already, but there are gonna be a couple minor tweaks that we have to do. After that, we're just gonna run through our code and make a couple small optimizations, things that we, again, don't necessarily need to do, but we're gonna do uh, because we'll make our code a little bit better and we are learning to be professional expert developers. So with that said, let's jump into Xcode and optimize our app. All right, welcome back everyone. I'm back in our Xcode project. In the last video, uh, we set up this awesome loading animation. So we open our app, when we launch it, we get this loading your profile. It does this really cool animation and then we jump into our view. And we're pretty much done with our app at this point, except in this video, we're gonna do a couple optimizations just to just kind of final touches on our app. Uh, just to bring it full circle here. So the first thing I want to do is uh, just update our app for the iPad. So if we look back in the first video, we set up in the project navigator, we set up our device for the iPhone as well as the iPad. And we made it so that it's portrait only. So we can't actually rotate the device. If, if I rotate the device here, it's not going to actually rotate. Uh, and that's because I tested this out, obviously, before I made these videos and just realized that it, this app doesn't look very good in landscape mode. But to be able to support uh, the iPad is a definitely a big positive for your app. So I think supporting iPad is definitely much more important than supporting landscape. And of course, we are supporting iPad. So let's run our app on an iPad and see what we need to do to update it for the iPad. So at the top here, I'm going to just uh, switch the device to, let's do an iPad Pro 12.9 inch. It should, doesn't really matter which iPad you do. Let's build it to that simulator and I'm sure there's a couple small things we're going to have to do uh, to update for the iPad. But one of the big factors uh, in Swift UI is that um, most of the screens that we've made are going to automatically adapt to the iPad. So because of that, um, we shouldn't have too much to do. So you saw we had the loading animation, it looked good, and then we jumped into the app and uh, obviously this does not look like the, the iPhone does right here. So we have this back button here, which is kind of strange. And um, then we have this also this strange view over here, like a navigation view. And a lot of people are probably freaking out right now, but this is very common because a navigation view has actually a different hierarchy when it's on an iPad versus an iPhone. So typically on an iPhone, the, the navigation view, you have the first screen, and then when you click the button, you go to the second screen. But on an iPad, we have the navigation view, like the, the first screen on a navigation view is actually just this left side here. And then the screen that you click on, so like this Bitcoin screen, is actually what would be kind of behind the navigation view on the right side here. So um, the colors are all off right now when we're doing this formatting. But if I click on this first row, um, it should bring me to the Bitcoin screen. So we are very close, but I want the iPad to just mimic the, the navigation on the iPhone, of course. So what we're gonna do, very simply, we're gonna jump into the Swiftful Crypto app.swift file. And on our navigation view, we're just going to add the dot navigation style. Navigation view style, and we're gonna make it stacked, stack navigation view style. And that's just going to force the iPad to have the same styling as the iPhone that we saw here. So if we rerun it, we uh, should get our loading your portfolio and then hopefully the screen looks a little more familiar, which I think it does. I'm gonna put the iPad into dark mode quick just so that we have dark mode on both devices. So let's go into the settings. And you can see even in the settings on the iPad, the, the navigation view looks a little different, but let's put the dark, dark mode on, jump back into our app here and our iPad looks good for the most part. I mean, we have our rows here. Clearly they're all loading. 
we have our let's see let's press the button this works we don't have any data on the portfolio that's why this looks blank we're gonna actually fix that in one second but uh, just looking at the formatting here for the iPad I would say that it looks pretty complete honestly we could add some updates to maybe make these rows a little bit bigger on the iPad um, but I actually kind of like it how it is and let's go into a detail page here let's click on Bitcoin and I love how just you know the animation looks good but also everything in our app is resizing to the device that's because when we built it out we based everything the graph uses a geometry reader that's why it's still going from end to end we have down here all these statistics are using the lazy V stacks with adaptable or flexible columns that's why these all look good uh, let's click the lead more that works and maybe you could go in and maybe change like the font sizes for the iPad but for our purposes I'm not gonna get into those minuscule details I think this looks pretty good let's click on the website see if that works looks like we're going to the Bitcoin website so that's good I'll jump back into the app here let's uh, let's click one more just to make sure that still works uh, maybe we'll do uh, Solana this looks pretty good I noticed that Solana doesn't have a description I guess we just didn't pull that from the internet or it's not on CoinGecko so that section's not here but we do still have the rest of the screen loading let's look at maybe one more file coin and yeah here we have the description it's back in uh, it's not that long but we do have all the data so it's looking good we have our logo in the top right uh, let's check out the settings view here and you'll notice that the settings view looks a little different between the iPad and the iPhone um, and that's because the settings the sheets on an iPad pop up in the center but regardless of that uh, everything in the sheet is still uh, looking good we can still click on all these we can still read all these sections so I don't think there's actually anything we have to do there and let's look into the uh, portfolio view so I'll jump into the portfolio view I'm gonna search for a coin here um, maybe BNB we have BNB here let's add some on our iPad and I did notice uh, unfortunately that when we click on the uh, amount holding on the iPhone it shows us this awesome number pad this decimal pad that we programmed in uh, I don't think that the iPad has one of these by default so that's why unfortunately uh, we're not seeing that same keyboard here if anyone knows how to get this decimal pad onto the iPad, please let me know. Um, but for now, let's just type in some numbers here. So maybe we have like 12. Uh, let's click save, see if it works. We got the check mark. We got the BNB is now in our portfolio. It's got 12 on it. Uh, and it's back on our screen. Portfolio value is updated. Um, let's add a couple more just to make sure everything is still working. Let's do uh, some dot at five save looks good let's change the BNB back down let's maybe make it uh, 10 see if we can update the values in core data so we have 10 and 5 I'm gonna close the app let's reopen the app loading your portfolio and uh, those should be saving in core data so just to make sure that they are saving in core data here they are they're still here uh, this is looking pretty good all right so we actually didn't have to do really that much uh, to update for iPad um, we could maybe just change the fonts because they do look a little small but I think if we had the iPad in front of us um, these font sizes would be okay uh, so I'm really not going to do anything else to update for the iPad you guys definitely can in your own time um, but I do want to just point out here that we didn't have to do much because when we programmed in Swift UI, you know, we took everything into account and it did everything to be adaptable, right? And that's why all of our screens and our views kind of automatically updated. All of our animations work perfectly. We have the animation from the left to the right. It's working on this device as well as this device, and it looks awesome. All right, you guys can probably hear the fan on my computer. And that's because I'm running these two simulators at the same time. So I'm going to X out of the iPad and let's move on to a couple other small optimizations that we can make in our app. 
All right, guys, so I folded up all my folders on the navigation view on the left side here, and I noticed that we still have the content view in our hierarchy. This was that first view we made in the first video just to check our colors. Um, we're actually not using this content view in our app, so let's just right click and delete the content view. Uh, it is definitely trash. I'm going to click run just to make sure it still builds without the content view. Build succeeds. And one other thing that I noticed while going through the code here, I noticed it a while ago, but I didn't want to make the app too confusing as we started building it. But if we open up, let's open up the utilities and services. And in our utilities, we have our networking manager. So every time we go to download data from the internet right now, we are calling this download function. And the download function is super handy because it's creating this data task publisher Going on, it's purposely going on to a background thread. We are mapping the response, making sure we have good data. We're coming back onto the main thread and then we are returning this whole thing as any publisher back to the rest of our app. So this is great, um, but there's a couple optimizations here. So I added this subscribe because I wanted to just purposely, for those of you who are learning to understand that when we are going on to when we are making these URL session calls, we need to always do them on a background thread. Uh, so that's why we explicitly put this line. But in reality, this URL session data task publisher is actually going on to a background thread automatically. So with that, we don't really need to subscribe to a background thread uh, as well. So I'm going to delete this and you can just comment it out uh, if you want, maybe just a reminder, but this data test publisher will already be on a background thread. So we don't need that extra line. I'm going to switch my device back to an iPhone 12 and build and run just to make sure that we are still going to get the data without that line. All right, data is still coming through. And the next thing I noticed is that um, we called receive on right after we did the map. So we downloaded the data on the background thread. We handled the response calling this function here on a background thread. And then we immediately jumped on to the main thread. So if I look at where we call this download URL and we call it a bunch of places in our app. So I'm going to just copy this. I'm going to command shift F to find. And I'm going to just paste in the download URL and we can call it and we see that we call it from basically all of our service files, the coin data service, coin detail service, coin image service. And if I look at the coin data service here, um, we're calling that download URL. So when we call this download URL, as we just saw, it goes onto the background and then returns onto the main thread and then the rest of the subscriber will run. So this line of code will go to the background, come back to the main thread, and then it will continue the rest of this. So what that actually means is that this decode operation is happening on the main thread. And that's fine, as we see in our app, like it's still definitely working, but it might be a little more optimal to do all this decoding because this is a fairly heavy process, decoding that data on a background thread and then after we decode let's just sync on a main thread so what i'm going to do is actually just take out this receive call on the main thread here and in all of our services we're going to then switch onto the main thread after we decode the data and the reason i didn't want to do this earlier is because we just need to make sure that we are well aware of when we are on background threads and when we are on main threads because we never want to actually be updating the UI from a background thread. So for example, if I delete this receive on the main thread here and I go back into our get coins and I don't update it yet, this will then go onto the background thread and it will never switch back to a main thread. So if I build and run it right now, We're going to get some errors in our app and it's not happening exactly right here right now, but we can see these purple warnings that we get and it's basically uh, it says publishing changes from background threads is not allowed. And that's because, you know, some of our subscribers, whichever subscriber caused this error first is showing these errors because we went onto the background thread to get data and then we never came back to a main thread. 
So we get these warning messages and these warning messages are really important if you ever get them to address. So what we're going to do is instead of going back onto the main thread immediately after we map, we're going to just go onto the main thread after we decode. So we'll call it here dot uh, receive on and we'll call it dispatch Q dot main. And the only thing that we need to now remember is that every time we call this download network manager dot download, it's going to that background thread. So we need to find all the instances where we call this throughout our entire code and make sure we are receiving on a main thread before we are syncing anything. So I'm going to go to the coin detail data service. We have it here, so let's do it after the decode. I'm just going to paste it in. Coin image service. Uh, we have it here. Let's do it after the try map. Uh, the market data service. Let's do it after the decode. As well as the portfolio data service. Uh, we actually don't need this one. This is just going to core data. Um, so that should be it. So we change it four times. I'm just going to copy this line of code and control F and just make sure we have it all four times. So on this one, we have receive on main queue. We have receive on main queue. We have receive on main queue and receive on main queue. All right. So I build it and run it one more time. We uh, should not get those error messages anymore. Hopefully those purple warning signs should be gone. And it's, we did the exact same thing in our code, except all of our decoding is now being done on a background thread. So that's a little bit more efficient. If I look at the memory, if I look at the CPU, um, we should have actually seen, you know, we can see here thread four, thread six, a couple background threads opened up as we loaded the app. And uh, that was just a tiny bit more efficient. Obviously we did not need to do that because the, as we can see, the CPU in our app is so, so super low that um, we're not running into er any errors or any UI issues. But, but generally speaking, the app is super efficient now. And when we start loading all these images, we can see um, that some of these images are loading on background threads. We can see them down here. And that's really efficient as well. Um, we're doing as much as we can on background threads and then just jumping back to the main thread before we update our UI. All these extra tasks down here on these background threads have been offloaded instead of being on the main thread. And the main thread is a little bit more faster. It's a little more efficient. It's a better user experience. All right, on that threading note, I wanna jump into the networking manager one more time. And um, there is a pretty cool call that we can do on pretty much any publisher. Uh, specifically used on a URL session data test publisher and it is called dot retry and here we can literally put the number of times we want to retry this function so I'm going to put three and very simply what this line is going to do is we're going to go and try to download that data from the URL and then we're going to take the response from that data and we're going to call this try map handle URL response. And if this URL response fails, so we have some logic here that it might fail. If it fails, when we get to this retry line, it's going to know that the publisher failed and it's going to actually just restart and it's going to retry to download the data from the internet again. And so this is kind of just a handy extra line we can add uh, just in case maybe like we went to download the data and for some reason the server uh, gave us a faulty response. We can just tell our app to retry that three times uh, so that if it fails, we do it again, we do it again. And then after three tries, it will just fail and jump back into our app. We obviously don't need this line. It hasn't been failing. Um, but if we rerun our app now, um, it should do the exact same thing. We're just giving the server maybe two extra tries to actually give us good data. Still works. And the I guess the last thing I really want to touch on here is that if we go to the portfolio tab, and if I remove all of these coins from my portfolio, so I'm gonna click on these coins and put them down to zero. And let's do it for all of these. So 
So if I just start the app at, from scratch, right? I've never used the app before. I would have zero coins in my portfolio. And clearly we have zero coins here, um, but this looks pretty plain. We don't have any message to the user. It kind of looks like data just didn't load on the screen. So I wanna add just a quick little message here to the user that they need to add, they need to click this plus icon to add coins to the portfolio. Let's jump into this view. This is the home view. So I'm gonna jump into the, uh, the core section of our app into the home views, home view. Click resume. And I'm gonna go down to where we have our portfolio coins list. So instead of just adding this list, let's add a Z stack here. Let's align it to the top. Let's add, let's add alignment of top. Let's open the brackets. And then in the Z stack, let's first check if we have coins. So we'll say if uh, vm.portfoliocoins is empty. So if there are no coins, and I'm also gonna check if the user is searching. So, because if the user is searching, we wanna add search results. So we'll say, uh, if portfolio coins is empty and vm.searchText.is empty, open the brackets. So if there are no coins and there is no search text, let's then put a text that says, uh, let's just put high for one second. And then we'll say else, and then we'll put the portfolio coins list if there of course are coins. And we'll keep this transition just on the entire Z stack here. So if I click play and jump over, uh, we have our high message here because there are no coins in my portfolio right now. So let's make this actually say, um, you haven't added any coins to your portfolio yet. Uh, click the plus button to get started. And then maybe let's do the control command space bar and let's throw in maybe uh, an emoji. Let's use the face with a monocle. Just cause I think he's looking to the top left which is where our plus button is. So that might be a nice little effect there. I'm gonna put a period and an exclamation point here. Um, let's format this a little bit. Let's give it a font of call out. Let's give it a foreground color of color dot theme dot accent. All right, let's actually give it a dot font weight of medium. Let's give it a multi-line text alignment of center. So it's aligned to the center and let's give it maybe padding of 50 just to make it a little more in the center of the screen. So that looks a little better to me. And let's just take this text cut it. I'm going to scroll down to, I'm going to jump to where we have the portfolio coins list and underneath it, I'm going to add private var portfolio, empty uh, text of type some view, open brackets. I'm just going to take our portfolio empty text and put that back up in our if statement at the top here. All right, I'm gonna build and run this to my simulator, which now has an empty portfolio. And hopefully we can see in the, the dark mode, um, this text. All right, we got our loading screen. It still looks pretty cool. We open our app, we have our data already loaded. We jump to our portfolio and it is empty. You haven't added any coins to your portfolio yet. Click the plus button to get started. And if we add a coin, uh, hopefully that goes away. So let's add maybe some Bitcoin. Let's let's imagine we had one Bitcoin. Let's click save. And now that message goes away and our Bitcoin is here. So that was perfect. The last and final thing that I noticed in this video is that the portfolio value section, the percentage is a little bit off. It's off by two decimal places. So the average in this portfolio right now should be between 27% and 13%. And if I look at the portfolio value up here, uh, it is 1,300%. So I am in the home view model and I'm down in the map market data section here. We have our percentage change and I think all we need to do is just take out this times 100. I'm not sure why I added that, but let's run it one more time and hopefully our percentage is the correct percent now. 
and now we're at almost 14%, which makes much more sense. And overall, I'm really liking how this app has turned out. So we have one more video in this series where we're going to just touch on the color scheme that we're using, and we're going to do a little bit of review on kind of just what we've learned, some of the features we've added. So thank you guys for watching. As always, I'm Nick, this is Swiftful Thinking, and I'll see you in the next video.